Welcome to Money Talk. I'm Kim Parley. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. If you live in Toronto or Vancouver and you own a home and you're looking to trade up, you may well be faced with this situation. Here's what's going on. You've bought and lived a first home for a number of years and the value of your home has appreciated, in some cases by quite a bit. So you're doing well, right? Well, yes and no, because the house that you now want to move into has also gone up and in many cases by a lot more. So chances are, financially, you are now faced with two options. Stay and renovate or move into a house that's maybe just modestly better than the one you're living in right now. This dilemma is what my guest calls buyer gridlock. Beata Caranci is chief economist at TD Bank Group, and she's here to look at the implication of that. Did I explain that properly? You did. Okay. I would just stress that like, as a reminder that it's about existing homeowners trying to trade up. Right. Because a lot of the times we focus on people trying to get into the market and there's absolute reduced affordability there. Yeah. But not just for them, also for people who've bought an entry level house who's trying to trade up at the same time. So it's happening in two segments of the market. Why did you do this report? I mean, you know, you, you've got lots of things you look at constantly. I know yeah. you're deluged with data. Why was it that the plight of the current homeowner is something you focused on? Yeah, I think it's mainly like when you look at uh, supply to, to the amount of sales to listings in the yeah. market, uh, a lot of people say, oh, this is a great uh, time to be selling your, your house. But sellers are also buyers. Yeah. Um, and so you have to look at both sides of the equation. And so when you hear buyers complaining about, you know, I'm selling a house and having trouble buying a house, then it became an, an instance where let's go take a look at what kind of supply is on the market, what kind of listings are on the market, and who could afford what segment of the market. And it became very clear when I did that, that th this market is really uh, starting to get uh, less affordable for a, a number of people, even people who've seen the value of their homes rise and are yeah. trying to trade up. Which is fascinating because everyone thinks, oh, your house has gone up, you know, good for you. Now mm -hmm. you get to buy something bigger. And that's just not the case, which is what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at this uh, one chart you have in the report. This is the Toronto and Vancouver uh, markets. And this is the number of listings mm -hmm. I think we're looking at. Tell me what we're looking at when we look at this chart and why it's important. So this is the, the, the sales to listings ratio that I was saying. And you can mm -hmm. see that it's, it's becoming quite elevated, which tells you there's a lot of people who are looking uh, to buy a home, which is great, because yeah. if you're a seller, you can find a dancing partner real fast yeah. in this type of market. But yeah. at the same time, that now puts you into the market of having to go out and buy, and you're going to get into bidding wars as a result of it, because there's a lot of dance partners out yeah. there. Yeah. So this is the effect that we're saying, that if you just look at it simply, you're saying, great, a lot of demand in this market, no problem selling your house. But eventually, if you're going to be a buyer, you're going to be in that same situation yourself. And then if we take a look at this in terms of just another way to look at this affordability, what you're mm -hmm. talking about is is the uh, the uh, the condo, sorry, the, the detached home ratio as compared to apartments or condos. Yeah. Uh, and this is uh, this is fascinating. Mm -hmm. Vancouver is off the charts on yeah. this one. So let's take a look at this. Tell me why this one matters in terms of, and, and why you focused on this. Yeah, so this is an interesting chart, right? So, um, you know, I know it's playoff season right now, uh, and we're heading towards the Stanley Cup, but uh, at the same time, when you're an economist, you never want a graph to look like a hockey stick. Yeah. You don't want it to be flat and then have this real tail uh, come up at the end of it, and that's exactly what the Vancouver market's looking at, like. And what that's telling us is that the uh, price differential between detached homes and condos is now more than three times. So you sell your condo, and it's three times more to get into the detached market. In the Toronto market, it's over two times more. So it's doable, but you have to take on a lot more debt than you would have had to historically to make that step up. And this helps explain why we're seeing so much leverage in the market and it's across all age cohorts. It's not just you know people in their 40s and 50s are doing the trade-up. We're seeing it at every segment because at the entry level, if you sell your condo, you're going to have to take on a lot more debt, and your debt service ratio goes up as a result of it, yeah. and your savings go down as a result of it. Which really brings that I'm going to ask the uh, control and we're listening a little inside baseball here to skip ahead to to, to the fourth graph here because I want to take a look at the renovation spending because mm -hmm. what happens then, of course, is people go great, yeah, you know that I'm not getting much more for that you know huge price I'm going to trade up for, so I'm going to renovate, and yeah. people are finding more value there and that's what's happening with the renovation spending. Yeah, it's skyrocketed. Yeah. Um, and again, once again, you can see how much it's differed from uh, historical relationships there. Uh, and this is specific to the people in the detached market. So like you mentioned off the top, you have people who are trying to get into the condo side into the detached market and they have a huge leap to make. Mm -hmm. the people in the detached market look out into the market and say there's a whole not, not a whole lot of listings unless I'm willing to pay a million or more, mm -hmm. uh, especially in the case of Toronto and in Vancouver, two million or more in terms of where the large amount of supply so is. So I'll spend 400 on a reno. Exactly. Yeah. And so this is what's happening. But what that does is you take what was an entry level home, you've now converted it a second story, 
uh, adding an extension on it, and now it actually becomes a trade-up house. Right. So and there's so, nowhere for those condo exactly. buyers to go. Exactly. Or someone getting into the market for the very first time. I love uh, my favorite part of your report um, mm -hmm. as, as she writes through it. She's got here, and I quote, "Boo-hoo!" <laughs> would, would say a millennial trying to get into the housing market for the first time. So you know, you, I, again, you're mm -hmm. showing the mechanics of this, but really, what this comes down to at the end of the day is that these millennials or anyone who's in a condo trying to get to a house, it just becomes harder and harder and harder. Yeah. And there's a trickle-down effect, right? Yeah. So ultimately, where the supply is coming online is predominantly in the condo segment. Um, and so millennial, their choices are getting reduced to, to the condo segment as an affordable option. So the diversity of stock out there is narrowing as we go forward. And what are the implications of that? So, you know, this happens, it is happening. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look like the trend's changing anytime soon. What are the economic implications of having people say, okay, your, your only choice is a condo? Yeah, well, you can buy a condo and that's fine um, until you decide it's not appropriate for your lifestyle. Right. Because you have a family and expands and you may not find it's, it's suitable in terms of square footage. Mm -hmm. At which stage you're going to have to make the choice to uh, either rent a house or you would buy a house and take on more debt. Mm -hmm. There's nothing in itself wrong with renting. Um, it does require you to have a higher degree of financial literacy because now instead of using your housing as your store of value and forced savings through the mortgage and then having that equity when you get older to sell and go off and do something else with it, downsize, you don't have that. You have to manage a larger stock of financial money. And so you better be aware of the <laughs> volatility in the financial markets. Mm. Um, your rate of return in the bond market these days is really poor, so you may have to take on more risk by going in the stock market. So the degree of financial literacy goes up as a result. You know, it. if I was to paraphrase, you can tell me I'm just being really blunt here. So people who have had wealth generated from housing have just been lucky, not necessarily savvy. That's right. And if people want to build wealth in the future, they're going to have to be savvy. They're going to actually have to understand how the mechanics of all mm -hmm. this work. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so what, uh, you know, barring kind of any massive changes in the market, I mean, you know, if we take this trend 10 years out, 20 years out, again, what does this mean for, you know, Toronto and Vancouver? I mean, is, you know, is there kind of a broader economic implication or is it more just look to New York and see what's happening there? Well, and this is what we're seeing. So we're already seeing that the implications play out. We're seeing a push out to the suburbs. Mm -hmm. And uh, likewise, we're seeing prices rise there at almost the same rate of what you're seeing in Toronto. Mm -hmm. So double digit gains starting to happen out there. Um, you're seeing seeing a density build up. So it's this what I was saying in the paper is you go you go up and you go out. Mm -hmm. You know, up into the sky, into the towers and out into the suburbs. Um, and this is what we've seen in places like London and New York. Toronto as a stock of condos as a stock of the total housing out there is at about 40%. Um, and if you go towards London and other places like Vancouver, it's upwards of 50%. In New York, it's upwards of 60%. So there's still room to grow on the condo side. Um, but those condominiums need, need to be built with more family-friendly, um, uh, yeah. you know, accommodations in mind. Well, you hear even in New York, I mean, obviously for years, people, you know, they buy a place and then they knock out the yeah. wall, they buy the one yeah. next door, and suddenly they got the whole floor. That's I right. mean, so you're going to hear a lot more of that probably in Toronto as well. Yeah, and I think to make it more, uh, you know, it's one thing to have it affordable, but it has to be livable at yeah. the same time. One thing we did not touch on, mm -hmm. um, which you do highlight in the report is, you know, we were talking about the domestic side of what's driving this housing market. Um, there's foreign investment. Yeah. Uh, obviously, people become much more interested in trying to find data to support actually how much is mm -hmm. out there. What, you know, what do you see in terms of foreign investment in the housing market? What is that going to get, you know, broader, deeper? What's happening? Well, there's no question that there's foreign investment happening in terms of, of, of lifting up those prices and sales in mm -hmm. uh, the Toronto and Vancouver markets. It looks like it's more prevalent in the Vancouver market. Um, and the way we know that is if you look at... Um, the correlation between Vancouver sales and foreign flows into deposits and currencies into Canada. It's one of those hockey stick graphs. Mm -hmm. They're both like way up. Um, and so that tells us that a lot of the influence happening in the Vancouver market um, is happening through the foreign sales segment. And it also makes sense because a lot of the sales activity is well over the 1 million mark. The median price is 1.4 million. Mm -hmm. That segment in the market um, is usually what we call um, like uh, inelastic to, to movement in prices, meaning it's more generated by wealth. People really don't care what the price is because they're wealthy and they'll move their money into yeah. it as opposed to income where it's more sensitive to the movement in the price. So what are we seeing, I mean, in terms of the Canadian dollar? Because I think one thing, of course, when you put your money in, you're moving it from China as an example, moving it to Canada, you want stability mm -hmm. of where you're going. Because, but So the, the if the Canadian dollar moving up and down, uh, it's been you know really high, mm -hmm. has moved down, coming back up. Yeah. How does that affect or does it affect the decision to come into Canada? It's certainly making it more affordable. So while we're feeling the effect of these rising prices, you know, relative to someone uh, from China or from the U.S., uh, these home prices uh, have a discount of about 20 to 30% relative to their currency. So it allows for some of that foreign influence to come in.
and, and take advantage of these prices because they're getting the currency influence. And so we, we think as in the last couple of years, it's had a fairly big impact. Again, a large part of it coming through the Vancouver market. It's very hard to follow the bouncing ball on this because there's not good data. Yep. So it's un the understanding that the Toronto market a little bit more even, you know, evenly dispersed in terms of price gains, mostly happening at the 600,000 and up level, that that may be more of an influence of domestic investors versus foreign. Interesting. Yeah. Beata, thanks so much. My pleasure. Beata Granzi, Chief Economist of TD Bank Group, joining me here in studios.